Rivet City is one of the largest and most important cities in the Capital Wasteland. And despite this, we find evidence that no matter our choices in Fallout 3, Rivet City is doomed to a disastrous end. But that's a topic for the end of this series. Rivet City is a central location for the primary plot of the game. But aside from this, it is the setting for a number of side quests and minor unmarked quests. Here we find dozens of personalities, each with their own histories, and each of these people are somehow involved in their own little sphere of petty politics. Council members vying for seats, orphans longing for father figures, young people longing for forbidden love. In this short series, we will explore everything there is to know about Rivet City. Our story likely begins in the fall of 2277. Rivet City is one of the most southeasterly locations in the entire Capital Wasteland, and to get here we have to fight through dangerous raider-infested territory. Despite that, there are many reasons we may come here at an early level. The main quest brings us here. As to the quests, the Wasteland Survival Guide, and You Gotta Shoot Him in the Head. You can learn why we come here for You Gotta Shoot Him in the Head by watching my video on the topic here. But no matter why we come here, when we arrive we see a derelict aircraft carrier rusting in the Potomac. This is Rivet City. When we came here to complete the quest Wasteland Survival Guide, we learned a lot about the history of this city. In that video, we learned that the aircraft carrier that became Rivet City was docked inside the Washington Naval Yard when the bombs dropped during the Great War. But after the Great War, the levels of the Potomac and the Anacosta Rivers dropped. The aircraft carrier floated away from the yard until it washed up where we find it here. It was then inhabited by Mirelurks and Raiders for many years until the remaining scientists who used to work at the pre-war Naval Research Institute cleared the aircraft carrier and moved in to use it as a research research lab. Led by the scientist Horace Pinkerton, they used the aircraft carrier's working hydroponics bay to conduct their experiments. It was Pinkerton himself, along with Annette Holmes and Brad Danvers, who formed Rivet City's first council and acted as the city's governing body. Since the city's founding, its relative safety attracted many visitors who became permanent residents. The offspring of both Holmes and Danvers still live here, even though Annette and Brad have long since passed. The success and safety of the city, as well as its working hydroponics bay, attracted a scientist named Madison Lee, who was working on a project to purify the Capital Wasteland's water. The other scientists working here at Rivet City fell in love with Madison Lee's project and completely abandoned Pinkerton and the research that he was doing at the time. Madison Lee worked her way onto the city council, and an angry Horace Pinkerton stormed off the ship, and for many residents, into history. But during the Wasteland Survival Guide quest, we discovered that Horace was still alive, conducting his experiments in the Mirelurk-infested broken bow of the ship, where, depending on our choices during that quest, he still lives. We don't know which real-world aircraft carrier Rivet City is based upon. It has no markings in the actual game, and it doesn't tell us in the Fallout 3 official strategy guide. However, when we looked at some of the original concept art for Fallout 3, we see that the ship depicted in the concept art and the finished product most closely resemble the USS Orskine, nicknamed the Mighty O. In the real world, the USS Orskine is named after the Battle of Orskine, fought on August 6th, 1777, during the Revolutionary War. There was no clear winner of that battle, and it was one of the bloodiest battles during the entire American Revolutionary War. The USS Orskine was completed and launched on October 13th of 1945. She had a long life of service, notably serving both during the Korean and Vietnam Wars. After a long life, she was stripped of anything valuable and then purposefully sunk on the 17th of May in 2006 to create an artificial reef. She is notable as being the largest vessel ever sunk to make a reef. But of course, that only happened in our own universe. If Revit City really is the USS Oriskany, then it was never sunk and turned into a reef. But now that we know the city's past history, it's time to learn its present history. Who are the people living here? As we climb a ramp to board the vessel, we find a beggar nearby named Carlos. Please, I'm dying. I need water. Please, please help me. I need water. I'm dying. Here, have some purified water. You mean, 
You don't want anything for it? I don't have any caps or anything. I can just have it. I can just have it for free? I insist, my friend. It's the least I can do to help. My... Thank you. Thank you so much. You've saved my life. Bless you. If we choose to give him purified water, we gain 50 karma. However, if we refuse to give him any water at all, the next time we arrive at Rivet City, we find him lying here dead. To gain access to the city, we punch the nearby security intercom. Welcome to Rivet City. Please wait while the bridge extends. With that, the guards of Rivet City extend their drawbridge. This is a wonderful animation that we see only once, much like the doors to Diamond City opening. The next time we visit Rivet City, we find the bridge in place. As we cross the bridge... Hold it right there. State your business in Rivet City. I don't answer to you, pal. On this boat, you sure as hell do. You don't get on without my say-so. So I'll ask you again. What are you doing here? Forget it. I'm out of here. Thanks for visiting Rivet City. Don't feel compelled to stop by again anytime soon. Oh, I'm just wandering around. Is that so? All right, you're free to roam around, so long as you don't do anything stupid, like try to slit my throat when I'm sleeping. You wouldn't try anything stupid like that, now would you? Actually, I'm looking for my father. And who might your father be? If he lives on this boat, I know him. I'm sure you don't know him. He lived in a vault his whole life. Oh yeah? And I'm a fairy princess. You keep up this smart-ass attitude, and you're gonna wind up floating face down in the river. Why does it matter who he is? Just let me pass. It matters because I don't let just anybody wander around this boat. I'm responsible for these people. So either you tell me what I want to know, or you don't get on. It's pretty damn simple. He's disappeared, and I'm just trying to find him, that's all. All right, all right. You can go on in. If I hear about any trouble, you're gonna wind up in the river. You get me? There was some sort of battle in the city yesterday. The gate guard said the gunfire went on for over an hour. That's why I'm glad I'm in here. Good old Rivet City. Me too. Nothing is getting through these walls. With that, Harkness steps aside and allows us to enter Rivet City. From this entrance, we find two doors, a door to the left which leads to a stairwell, and a door directly in front of us that leads to the marketplace. This marketplace is only open during the day, so if we try to enter at night, if caught, we're attacked on sight. So it's best to visit Rivet City for the first time during the day. The Rivet City Marketplace is the heart and soul of the ship. We find it in what was once the ship's hangar deck, but in 2277, instead we find five merchants. There are four ways in and out. We entered from the most northwesterly entrance, and there are two exits east of us, stacked on top of each other. One door to the midship deck, and another to the upper deck. The southern exit simply leads to a platform overlooking the broken bow of the ship. But as we're here to get to know the people of Rivet City, we can start by talking with Seagrave Holmes. Holmes has been here all his life, and he is the grandson of one of the city's founding members, Annette Holmes. It is Seagrave Holmes here who is primarily responsible for fortifying and reinforcing Rivet City so that it can withstand attacks from raiders and super mutants from the city. But when he's not repairing the old carrier with a blowtorch in hand, he acts as a merchant. He runs a shop called Rivet City Supply. Howdy, I'm Seagrave. Seagrave Holmes. I have a little of just about everything here. You got a T-51B suit of power armor? No? Then you don't have everything. A what? Look, if you just want to crack wise, go somewhere else. But if you've got stuff you want to sell, then I'm your man. How do I know you won't rip me off? You don't. No guarantees in the wasteland. No rebates or exchanges either. Oh, and you break it, you buy it. What have you got to sell? I've got a little bit of everything. Seagrave has a decent inventory, just over 300 caps to barter with. He has a small selection of miscellaneous junk items, a decent inventory of low to mid-level armor and weapons, a few stim packs of Nuka-Cola, but he's really primarily useful as being a source of ammunition. He has a wide selection of many of the most useful ammunitions in the game. See you later. 
pitched directly across from Seagrave Homes and Rivet City Supply is a shop called Potomac Attire, run by a man named Bannon. Welcome to Potomac Attire. I am Bannon, proprietor and city council member. I carry discriminating attire for discriminating customers. So what, I'm not good enough to shop here? That's not what I meant. What I meant was that my goods are of the highest quality, which I assume is what you're looking for. I see you are also a person of refinement. Between you and me, keeping out the riffraff is good for business. So you're on the city council? Dr. Lee, Chief Harkness, and I are all on the council. We meet every Monday morning. I can be very influential, if you know what I mean. Far more than Seagrave Holmes. Well, you've got a beef with Seagrave? Well, it's really none of my business. Don't want to get mixed up in politics, eh? Don't blame you. Or we can say Seagrave. Oh, yeah, he's clueless. So you've met him, eh? Well, he wants to replace me on the council. Now I can't have that. No siree. He's a shady character, I just can't prove it. If someone were to find something incriminating in his room, well, let's just say I would be very appreciative. And with that, we start the unmarked quest, Council Seat. Looks like we need to find and break into Seagrave's room. But first, maybe Bannon can tell us something else. Why are all of you guys living on a boat? It's a place to live, safe from raiders and super mutants. With Dr. Lee on our side, maybe we can even begin to rebuild the world. Interesting. Well, I'm here to do business with you. Straight to the point. I like that. Bannon's Potomac attire inventory is very different. Like Seagrave, he has around 300 to 400 caps to barter with, but aside from a few stim packs, all he sells is a bunch of mostly useless clothing. He has a few low-level leather armor pieces, and that's about it. Hey, Bannon, can you repair some of my stuff? I'll see what I can do. He speaks so hesitantly because his repair skill is only 15, which makes him pretty useless. It's been a pleasure, Mr. Bannon. Come back soon. Bannon gave us a note. Bannon's request. Bannon has asked me to search Seagrave Holmes' room to see if I can find anything incriminating about him. Then Bannon can stop him from taking over his council seat. Now before we go off rummaging through this guy's private room, we can see how Seagrave feels about the council. Bannon tells me you're trying to steal his council seat. Steal it? Hardly. He runs the council like it's his own personal bank account. He's supposed to represent all the market businesses, not just himself. It's about time he was replaced. So Holmes accuses Seagrave of corruption. I think Holmes may have other motives for wanting to be on the council. After all, historically, his family has been on the council. His grandmother founded the city, after all. And he has personally sacrificed a lot to keep the city afloat. Maybe he feels that the city owes him. Well, to become better informed, I don't think we can only snoop through Seagrave's room. We'll start by tracking down Bannon's private room. And to do so, we move to the northern corner of the marketplace and go up the stairs. This brings us to the doorway to the upper deck, which is directly above the midship deck. The upper deck is a series of conjoined hallways connected primarily to many small rooms that act as the living quarters for the city's residents. To the northwest, we do find a connection to the science lab on board the ship, and to the southwest, we find a door that leads to the stairwell, which was the leftmost door upon first arriving at the city. If we navigate down the hallway towards the stairwell, the first door on the right before the stairwell is a locked door to Bannon's room. The lock is very easy, but it is marked as red. So to conduct our investigation, we will lose a bit of karma. Inside, we don't find much, but we do find a wall-mounted terminal to the northwest. This is locked with an easy lock, but again, we lose karma by hacking it. If we do, we find two entries. The first is view agenda, and we see that this is a rough agenda for the next council meeting. Fence on the flight deck, taxes. Gate tax, water tax, weapons contribution program. So Bannon's ideas are all about increasing taxes and finding ways to take weapons from the citizens. Though the fence on the flight deck may be a good idea. Backing out of this, we find council meeting minutes. In attendance, science representative Dr. Madison Lee, civilian representative Bannon, security representative Harkness. Bridge repair continues to be a drain on funds. Permanent bridge considered, but dismissed as too risky in case of attack. 
so the fact that the bridge is a drawbridge means that it breaks down a lot, but it's their primary means of defense against super mutant attacks. It's costing them a lot of money, but they can't get rid of it. To solve this problem, we see that Bannon has proposed a bridge tax for non-residents only. The council members voted on it, but the vote failed. In the next item, hydroponics and city health continues well, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Lee and her scientific team. However, system breakdowns are commonplace, requiring much maintenance. Lee proposed recruiting other scientific minds from Tenpenny Tower or the Underworld, but that vote failed. Sounds like Lee is not a ghoul bigot. She likely wanted to recruit Dr. Barrows from Underworld. The vote likely failed because he is a ghoul. The scientific mind from Tenpenny Tower that Lee refers to is likely Dr. Banfield, though I doubt he would come. He has, after all, grown accustomed to his cushy lifestyle at Tenpenny Tower, and if he moved to Rivet City, he'd probably miss his examinations of Susan Lancaster. And the next one attempts to clear out the Mirelurk infestation in down below continues as usual. Harkness and team is able to contain them and occasionally wipe them out, but they continue to nest in the area, posing a theoretical risk if they ever turn aggressive towards higher decks. So unlike the broken bow of the ship, which is completely overrun with Mirelurks, the Mirelurks on this part of the ship are contained in what they're calling the down below. Bannon suggests closing off the lower deck four. The vote fails, which I don't get because that sounds like a reasonable idea. Funds and ammunition allocation for a Mirelurk cleaning operation proposed by Harkness. Vote passes. Dr. Lee leaves early to oversee hydroponics testing, and the meeting is adjourned. It's clear from these notes, Dr. Lee is the primary force on this city council. Now that we've explored the upper deck, we need to go back into the marketplace, and this time go down the stairs to the door directly beneath this one, which leads to the midship deck. The midship deck has nearly an identical layout to the upper deck. Like the upper deck, it has a door to the stairwell in roughly the same location, but unlike the upper deck, it has two doors to the science lab instead of one. And it's also the home of the Capital Preservation Society. This is where we found Abraham Washington while doing the quest Stealing Independence. I explored every corner and exhausted his dialogue in that video, which you can watch here. We find that Seagrave's room is the first door on the left upon entering the midship deck from the marketplace. Like Bannon's room, it's marked red, which means we lose karma by hacking it. Inside, we find a terminal on the table, but strangely enough, even though it's locked with an average lock, it's not marked red. After hacking it, we find three entries. The first, survival weapon idea. Had an idea for a survival weapon. There are all these railroad spikes laying around the wasteland. I thought to be able to build some sort of slingshot to fire them like bullets. I tried some really big rubber bands, but that didn't work. I wonder if I could use steam as a power source. <laughs> what Seagraves is describing here is of course a railway rifle. I'm surprised he hasn't seen one. In the next one, Bannon, Dr. Lee, we both know that Bannon does not have the best interests of Rivet City at heart. He is only interested in making a profit. He would sell his own children, if he had any, for an extra bottle cap. He needs to be removed. I would be glad to step forward as his replacement. Sincerely, Seagrave Holmes. Oh, that's quite magnanimous of Seagraves to volunteer his time like that. Unless, of course, he's just making this up about Bannon, simply because he wants the council seat. In the next one, regarding Bannon, we find a response from Dr. Lee. Seagrave, I do not wish to get pulled down into petty political bickering. Bannon has not done anything wrong. If the time ever comes when he does something truly harmful to Rivet City, the other council members will look into it. Until then, I have a lab to run. Yours, Dr. Madison Lee. Despite her importance on the city council, she's preoccupied by her lab. She doesn't really have the time and attention to deal with these kind of matters. I wonder then if she's really the best representative to sit on the city council. But could anyone else from the science lab best represent her department? While exploring Seagrave's room, we find an assortment of scrap and many containers that are not marked owned, which means we can loot from them freely. And as we're about to leave, we find two hollow tapes underneath his cot. One of them we need to save for later, but the leftmost one is marked Seagrave's incriminating letter. Opening it up in our pip boy, You've turned us down twice now, Holmes. This is my last appeal. We used to be friends. We used to do business together. All I want is to sell our product in Rivet City. 
I'm sure the city could use slaves to help with the rebuilding. Paradise Falls has slaves to sell at a good price. You used to sell me wastelanders you captured before you got all full of yourself. You aren't as pure as you pretend. Help me, and we can both make a nice profit. Regards, Eulogy Jones. Holy cow. So Seagraves used to be a slaver. This is as incriminating of evidence as we could possibly find. But it does sound like Seagraves is a reformed slaver. It sounds like he has at least tried to put that lifestyle behind him. It also means that at some time in his past, despite likely being born here at Rivet City, where his family is from, he took to wandering the wastes, where he got in trouble with his old pal Eulogy Jones. With this evidence in hand, we can take it back to the marketplace and present it to Bannon. Welcome to Potomac Attire. I think I've seen you in here before. When you're ready to buy, just let me know. I found a letter in Seagrave's room. It's from some slavers. Really? I... I mean, I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. Tell Danvers about that letter right away. That will squash any hope he has of replacing me on the council. Don't tell her I asked you to find it, though. That would backfire in a nasty way. Harkness is in charge of security, but Danvers is directly beneath him. Before we go off showing this evidence to Danvers, we can try to talk with Holmes about it. Take a look around. I got all kinds of stuff in here. You've been doing business with slavers, and I have a letter that proves it. If you had read that letter, you'd know I'm no slaver. And you know I'm not dealing with them. But if that letter gets out, they won't trust me. I'll never get a seat on the council, and Bannon will make me pay for trying to replace him. If you care about Rivet City half as much as I do, tell Danvers that Bannon is blackmailing me. But don't show her the letter. So we have two choices. We either show the letter to Danvers, accusing Holmes of being a slaver, or we inform Danvers that Bannon is trying to blackmail Holmes. Blackmail which is nearly as disgusting. Well, to find Danvers, we have to go back out the door that leads to the drawbridge. But instead of crossing the drawbridge, we turn right to enter the stairwell. The stairwell is the smallest local map in the entire city. It is comprised of four levels. We arrived on level two, but the level below us has one exit to the Muddy Rudder Bar. We'll visit the bar at a later episode. The second level connects to the drawbridge, where we just came from, and the midship deck, where we find the Capital Preservation Society. Floor three directly above us has only one door that leads to the upper deck. Here we find the Weatherly Hotel, but to find Danvers, we need to take the stairwell all the way to the fourth floor. Here we find one door that leads to the bridge tower. The bridge tower is the most prominent feature of Rivet City that we can see from the exterior. It towers above the flight deck and is comprised of many levels, most of which exit back out to the flight deck. This first level of the bridge tower is on the main level of the flight deck, so each of the doors here lead out to the flight deck. This first level is a bit of a dining room. Taking the stairwell up to the second level, we see that it is a bunk room for security. This has two doors that also lead out to the flight deck, but because this is higher up than the flight deck level, these doors lead to little platforms overlooking the deck. If we open the door to the right, we eventually find an ammo crate here, and we can overlook the great counterweights connected to a pulley system that caused the drawbridge to function. Back inside the bridge tower, the opposite door to the flight deck brings us to a platform where we just find two vault tech lunchboxes. There is, however, a gap in the fence here that we could use to jump down to the flight deck if we wanted. Floor three of the flight deck leads to another security bunk room, and it's here where we find Commander Danvers sleeping in her cot. Here we also find a Mr. Gutsy named Private Jones. Sir, yes sir, Private Jones reporting. So what's your story, Slag Heap? Sir, this slag heap is guarding the armory, sir. At is Private. I'm here to inspect the armory. Sir, you are not authorized to enter the armory. Sir, please don't make me shoot you, sir. Or we can pass a speech check to say, Private, there's a security emergency on the flight deck, which is a lie. Sir, this slag heap appreciates the intel. Moving to secure the flight deck, sir. With that, Private Jones races down the stairs to the flight deck. With the guard gone and Danvers asleep, we can take the opportunity to pick the very hard locked door to the west. Alternatively, we could pick a key from Sergeant Danvers. However, on the other side of the door, we have to take care of a laser turret. Uh -huh. Test 
damn the sight of your own blood? Our reward for accessing the armory is meager. We find a variety of weapons lying about, Chinese assault rifles, 10mm pistols, and a whole bunch of very hard locked containers, most of which are empty. I ended up finding two combat helmets and one piece of combat armor in one, a sledgehammer and assault rifle, and that was really about it. So it was pretty disappointing. Or if we follow Private Jones, he takes us all the way down the bridge tower and out the door to the flight deck. He then hangs out by this baseball diamond for a while before heading back into the bridge tower. The flight deck is huge. It looks like the residents have put together a makeshift baseball diamond here in the northeast corner of the flight deck where the kids can play. Near to this baseball diamond, we find a stairwell leading down to a lower platform beneath the drawbridge. If we follow this platform southwest, we find a tiny little nook where we find two ammo containers and a pile of blood. Directly behind us is a first aid kit. I thought that maybe we could find a body next to this blood, so I reloaded a previous save to before I discovered Rivet City, only to discover that there was no body here. If we follow this path beneath the drawbridge, we find one of the many unique aircraft aboard this aircraft carrier. This is a beautiful folded wing aircraft, and it looks identical to the one we find crashed in Point Lookout, except that this one's wings can fold. The fighter jet really has no real-world counterpart. It looks like a completely new invention post-divergence. However, it does closely resemble a Lockheed P-80 shooting star. The connection between the two is strengthened by a terminal entry we find in the Museum of Technology, which mentioned that the fighter jet currently on display in the museum, which is identical to the ones we find here on Rivet City, was sponsored by the Lock Reed Company, which of course is very similar to the real world Lockheed Company, which made the P-80. The major difference between the P-80 in our world and the aircraft we find here on Rivet City is that the P-80 shooting star did not have folding wings. As we explore the flight deck of Rivet City, we see more of these jets all over the place, and we can look off the deck to the Broken Bow, which we know is infested with Mirelurks and is the home to Pinkerton's lab. But we still need to talk with Danvers, so back into the bridge tower, we can again scale the bridge tower to the third floor. Danvers is still asleep, but before talking to her, we can access her nearby wall-mounted security terminal. It's locked with a very easy lock, but we do not lose karma by hacking it. Inside, we find only one security log. Two more reports of Mirelurk noise from the bow section. There isn't a damn thing that can be done about it. As soon as we clean out one nest, another moves in. I just wish everyone would stop griping about it. Railing on the flight deck is still broken. Problem has been referred to the council. Brock got in a fight with that sister character. If it happens again, I'm going to have to kick sister off the ship. Caught James Hargrave stealing food at Gary's galley. Tammy paid the fine, although she blistered my ears the whole time. Danvers here is another descendant from one of the town's founders. She's the daughter of Brad Danvers. So while Seagrave Holmes became a wastelander, a slaver, and then came back to become a merchant, Lana Danvers has been here her entire life. Before waking her, we can finish exploring this third level. Like the other two, it has doors that lead to the flight deck. But like the second floor, this third floor leads to a platform above the flight deck. If we take the door at the end of the northeastern hallway, we find one ammunition box and a medical brace. But if we take the door to the southeast, we just find a platform with some broken railing. Nothing else on this level. When ready, we can finally wake Commander Danvers to talk with her about the council members. Maybe you don't know who you're talking to. I'm Commander Danvers, Assistant Chief of Security. Whoa, I just wanted to ask you something. Yeah, well, I don't have time for newbies like you. You got something on your mind, spill it. So, you report to Chief Harkness? I'm his second in command. I run the night shift and he runs the day shift. Is this conversation going somewhere? Because I've got things to do. At this point, we have two options. If we want to side with Bannon, we choose the option to say, I found this letter in Seagrave's room. I thought you should see it. This is bad. Seagrave Holmes was angling for a seat on the council. He can forget about that now. Once the market vendors get wind of his past, they'll never trust him. Too bad. If we choose this option the next time we talk with Bannon... I heard that Danvers found a letter from Slavers in Seagrave's room. That will teach that b 
bastard to mess with me. I think you've earned a permanent discount here. He gives us a schematic for the Death Claw Gauntlet, which improves any schematics we currently have, and offers us a 10% discount at his shop. For you, I always offer my best price. But if we do, Seagrave Holmes is none too pleased. You sneak into my room, steal my property, and then tell the world about it. I'd ban you from my shop if they'd let me. Instead, I'll just have to settle for ripping you off. And now all of his prices are 10% more expensive for us. Alternatively, we could side with Seagraves and say Bannon is trying to blackmail Seagraves Holmes. That's pretty underhanded, even for Bannon. Once word gets out, I bet the market vendors won't want him to represent them anymore. Thank you for your help, citizen. If we choose this option the next time we talk with Holmes... Hey, I heard that Bannon got caught trying to frame me. I also heard you ratted him out. I think you've earned a true blue friendship discount. We get a 10% discount, but no weapon schematics. Anything for you. You sure fixed Bannon good. But if we do, Bannon says... You told Danvers that I was trying to blackmail Seagrave. Thanks to you, they've suspended council meeting and are probably going to censure me. I can't ban you from my shop, but they can't tell me what to charge. And he charges us 10% more to buy from his shop. With that, we complete the unmarked quest council seat, and we run out of time. We'll continue exploring Rivet City and all of the people that live here in the coming week. But what are your thoughts on this quest? Who do you think was the best one to side with? Seagraves Holmes or Bannon? From a practical perspective, I think it's best to side with Seagraves. After all, he is the only merchant of the two that has ammunition. And ammunition is still useful and valuable even later in the game. But what about the best moral option? Do you think the residents of Rivet City deserve to know about Seagraves' past? After all, he used to be a slaver. Or do you think it's better to keep his past a secret if only to remove Bannon from his council seat? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many videos each week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss the next episode in my Rivet City series, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a brand new shirt in the shop. Cheer, cheer, cheeriest. Celebrate your love of fizzy soda in this lovely portrait that comes in a wide variety of both men's and women's sizes and in a wide array of colors. It also comes on other products as well, smartphone cases, mugs, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon this coming week, bright and early, with more brand new videos.